computer. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good First day to Rockwell. Yes. Greetings. We're so happy to be with you, um, even if it's only virtually. Uh, so what we are going to do um, for the next four weeks uh, is talk about the intersection of faith and mental health with the idea that we're one integrated whole human being. Um, and so we need, sometimes we keep faith and mental health apart, um, but part of being whole and holy is that integration of those things. Um, so each week we're going to be focusing on um, a mental health uh, challenge that we might be facing during this time. And this week we're going to be talking about anxiety. Um, so as we move through this time together, um, Doyle is going to share from his wealth of mental health um, experience and working in the therapeutic field to kind of inform us um, and make us aware of anxiety. And then both of us are just going to go back and forth and talk about um, the tools that we know from our training, but also just from our personal lives on how to deal with each mental health challenge and that being anxiety this week. Uh, and then we will end um, with the time of a kind of meditative devotional um, so that we can exit our time together, hopefully in a state of greater peace than we entered it. So with that being said, Doyle, would you Thank take us away? Thank you, Amy. Uh, well, anxiety is a normal, God-given experience of life. So part of being human is that we have God-given emotions, and for some, it gets focal, uh, pinpointed through uh, what we call anxiety. So it's, the way that I think about it is that anxiety is, it can be an inhibitor to growth, or it can be a contributor to growth. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is, what do we do with this God-given emotion? Or how might God be speaking to me through my anxiety that can help me grow in this laboratory of experience that, that we're naming today? Uh, Bene Brown is a person that I really like and respect her work and her research. And she said, this, I read it this past week, that if we don't name the emotions, they will eat us up. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about anxiety, anger, fear, uh, whatever. If you if we can't name it, then it's going to go somewhere. It's uh, Amy and I were talking earlier today about how anxiety is kind of an internalized energy, mm -hmm. and sometimes it goes to our head, sometimes it goes to our gut, sometimes it impacts our sleep or not being able to sleep. So if we don't name it and we don't respect it, it's going to find its outlet in some way. Reinhard Niebuhr said that anxiety is at the core of understanding our human condition. So as we are thinking these next few weeks about the integration of mental health and faith, it's an opportunity for us to ask ourselves, okay, what is going on within me, mm -hmm. my head, my gut, my soul, and what can I learn about myself and what can I learn also about God? So it's our prayer for Amy and me, it's our prayer that we can have a opportunity, an opportunity for growth and learning. Mm -hmm. What's um what can you describe some of the symptoms like common symptoms but then also maybe lesser known symptoms of anxiety so we can help identify that experience in ourselves? Okay. So you know like with depression we have a label that's major depression which is a uh more debilitating expression of depression and we'll talk more about that next week but with anxiety we don't have major anxiety. We don't have any label like that. Some people uh, really get into their head 
And I've heard I, my psychiatrist friend, uh, Robert Dean, has said that the average person can take a thought into their brain and then they can let it go. A person that's anxious and obsesses or ruminates takes a thought into their head, but it's, it gets stuck. And I often think about a, a hamster wheel that sometimes the thought just kind of gets stuck and you can't let it go. And it just, it, you ruminate and you obsess. And sometimes the debilitating behaviors would be uh, like what we call OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder which is the obsessing, which is the cognitive part, the compulsion behavior, whether it's washing hands or closing the door or locking the door, whatever it is, it's, it's all anxiety driven. So sleep would be one manifestation. Uh, inability to eat would be another manifestation. Focusing on minutia or something that is very, it's important, uh, but it, it gets, it gets uh, magnified in a way that's not realistic. Those are kind of the more, more common things. Now, some people, you've, you've, I'm sure you've heard of people that have behavioral tics and behavioral manifestations. Those are more rare. Some people will have a tendency to pull their hair. Uh, yeah. Some people, uh, and we're going to talk about this in our third week, I think, uh, they, they drink or they drug, use drugs to uh, respond to the, the energy or what's going on with the anxiety. Yeah, self-medicating. Self-medicating. Um, I know for me, uh, in years past, when I really had a hard time with anxiety, it has deeply impacted my sleep. Um, another physical manifestation of it for me was it kind of felt like there was this an actual hand that um, was ice cold gripping my heart mm. um, and it would kind of jolt me even especially when I was trying to fall asleep I'd be right on the cusp of sleep and it's it's like it would physically hurt um, and then I would jolt awake so um, just to offer some other symptoms that I personally have experienced with anxiety um, if that's something you're experiencing um, it is likely a manifestation of anxiety. And, and the reason we're going over these symptoms, as Doyle said, is that it is helpful to be able to name something. Um, that just helps us have power over the experience. It's that first step of acknowledgement. Um, and it also makes just finding resources to deal with it much easier. Which, speaking of which, Doyle, what are some resources, tools, tips um, that you've come across either in your personal or professional life when it comes to dealing with anxiety? Well, Amy, I love, I love the example you gave about the hand. Mm -hmm. And so one way to think about that would be to uh, journal about mm -hmm. that experience and what, what, I mean, it's a very tangible experience, right? I mean, yeah. it's very concrete. So, uh, mm -hmm. Journaling is a excellent way to get it out. We, we, we tell the children who are in Hope for Grieving Children that are sometimes get anxious after the death of a parent that you've got to get the feelings out. So journaling is one way. Art uh, is another way. Um, we, we've mentioned before in our class about the welcoming prayer uh, that's another way that you can integrate your experience into your faith in the sense that, as we've talked about before, we want to, we have a human tendency to deny, repress, uh, minimize, project these thoughts and feelings. And part of the growth is to be able to name it and to, as a welcoming prayer, you welcome the anxiety into your mindfulness and you listen to it and you are quiet so that you can pay attention and respect it. Yeah, that, that reminds me of a couple different um, techniques that I've heard of, um, some of which I practice and have found to be really helpful. 
Um, so first, on that note, the welcoming prayer reminds me of um, Elizabeth Gilbert is an author, and she did a podcast on creativity, and she talked about fear versus love. And so as a creative exercise, although it is also therapeutic, she suggested writing a letter to yourself from your own fear. Mm. And so that, of course, requires some personification, some humanization of that fear or anxiety, um, as we're addressing in this uh, episode. Um, so, Dora, when I hear you say the welcoming prayer to welcome anxiety, um, I think for me to make that accessible, I have to, I, my mind immediately goes to imagining this little toddler version of me which if you have ever had uh, Wednesday night supper with me, or if I visited your Sunday school class, I've seen photos of my niece who's about to turn three and she looks like a mini me. <laughs> so I imagine this little adorable toddler coming up to me the way that lots of toddlers do and they're anxious um, because of what's going on around them and they don't understand because they don't have adult experience, they don't have adult coping capabilities. And so when I imagine my anxiety personified like that toddler, it, it invites this compassion and empathy mm. for this part of myself. Like, oh, of course she's anxious. She doesn't understand. Um, and so I think of that welcoming prayer in those really um, human, terms mm -hmm. as if I were sitting down I'm sitting on the floor of my condo right now so if I was sitting down on the floor and I saw this little curly-haired toddler coming up be like okay what what is it you're saying mm -hmm. so if you've had experience with toddlers mm -hmm. you know that sometimes they speak a whole nother language when they're in the midst of anxiety or crying and so you have to it's, it's not going to immediately be this coherent message of this is what I'm afraid of, but to create this patient space, like, okay, I'm listening. What is it you're trying to tell me? Mm. Which I know for many of us who didn't grow up with that kind of inner child dialogue that can feel very woo woo or new age. Um, but I would invite you just to try it. Um, to see what happens. Um, I do believe that the Holy Spirit is at work in things like that, which leads me to the next thing, um, the next kind of practice. Can I say um, one? Sure. I love your compassion. Your compassion for that three-year-old child that knows no other and needs to learn how to respond in a healthier way. And think about that in terms of how God thinks and responds to us in our unknowing. Yes, exactly. And I mean, this is a drum I have been beating and will continue to beat for the rest of my life and ministry is love your neighbor as you love yourself. It is not self-indulgent to be kind and even brutally compassionate with yourself, especially the parts that you most want to abandon, like your anxiety. It is essential to do that because you will love others as you love yourself. Um, so for that reason alone, you need to work on being brutally kind and compassionate and patient with the parts of yourself that you're the most ashamed of or the ones that you most want to jettison from who you are. You might be sitting there thinking, well, but I hate that I'm anxious. I should be able to just trust in the Lord. Right. I don't have enough faith. God is not saying any of that to you. So you do not need to be saying any of that to you. Right. It is ineffective. Um, and it is not um, embodying God's love to yourself, which will inhibit you from embodying God's love to other people, which is what we're called to do on this earth. So it's very serious work um, and very worthy work for you to, and for me and for Doyle, for all of us um, to practice embodying love um, compassion, patience, even when it feels self-indulgent 
to ourselves for those reasons that I just explained. Um, but Amy, I think what you're talking about is being intentional. Yes. And you're talking about going with your thoughts, the good thoughts, the healthy thoughts that you have. Uh, I remember years ago when I was a chaplain, I had this supervisor that uh, used to have this quote, it's easier to act your way into a new way of feeling mm -hmm. than to feel your way into a new way of acting. In other words, you go with your thoughts and the feelings will follow. If you wait for your feelings, you're going to be waiting a long time. Yeah. So you're talking about being intentional. Yes. And I, I think even with that kind of something you, to go back to something you said earlier, um, going ahead and acknowledging those feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's really helpful to personify them as toddlers because I have compassion for them. Right. Um, and to be like, no, yeah, I do actually feel really anxious. Mm -hmm. I actually don't trust God right now. I'm actually mad at God. Um, that you have to identify and name them um, in order to move anywhere new. Um, another practice that I think uh, has, has been really helpful for me and can be something that um, you can try at home is the more artistic, creative way, mm -hmm. which I know for many of us, we would not label ourselves as artists or poets or creatives um but to be made in the image of god is to be a creative fun fact um also creating is not about achieving it's just about the joy of playing the joy of creating and exploring and expressing. Um, so, sorry and expressing yes and expressing exactly and so i think with art um, even if it's something like poetry, you know, my description of this cold hand that's gripping my heart, if I can kind of start exploring that in a more artistic way, so maybe writing down that poetic image, I think that also is another way we can get at um, maybe the message that God wants to give us in that moment. So for that, it could be like, well, what would a warm hand that slowly like releases that and then it's just resting on my chest as I just breathe in and out and I think oh yeah that would be the hand of God that would be the hand of that divine parent as opposed to this cold anxiety so it's another way you can kind of get at it at a side angle sometimes it's hard to directly address um, what we're facing Sometimes you can, but other times it's, there's a block. And so I think art and creativity is this um, gift from God that we can sort of circumvent that difficulty and get at it from another angle. Well said. Thank you. Um, before we move on to our final um, meditative devotional moment. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share about anxiety, Doyle? Uh, these days of uncertainty are anxiety triggers. Yes. And you and I were talking earlier today about grief mm -hmm. and the prevalence. You, you said grief is looming and so it's, it's a normal human response, I think. And one of the things that we know, you're talking about toddlers, one of the things we know about children whose life had been turned upside down with the death of a parent mm -hmm. is that they feel completely out of control. Mm. Completely out of control. And it's not, not uncommon for a child to regress in their own development. And we try to normalize that for the caregiver, whether it's the grandparent or the other parent, to respect it, that it's normal, that they, they are going back to a more safe, a safer place. Mm. So, you know, anxiety is all a part of what's going on in 2020. And we're living in different days. 
And Amy and I were talking about earlier today how we, we really wish we could do what we're doing today with a small group and we could get dialogue and discussion, but just due to the circumstances, we're not able to do that. But we'll be offering things like this again, but this is kind of a, a first shot at it. And it's, it's better than nothing, uh, but it's certainly not the ideal. Right. Um, so we're grateful for your patience um, when my internet cuts out <laughs> um, or maybe when the, free, the screen freezes for a moment. Um, thank you for your patience and your grace in that. Um, I wanted to add to what you just said, Doyle, about um, grief is looming. Um, and, you know, I, I hadn't heard that about the regression that can accompany grief. Um, I know for me, a lot of the social media <clears throat> that I've been consuming has talked so much about, let's capitalize on this time. Let's be super productive. Let's work out. Let's clean the house. Let's make sure you keep your routine exactly like how you had it. Dress up for work, get up at the same time. And we were talking about this in one of my seminary classes, which is now fully online. And I said, should we though? Hmm. Should we try to make the most of this? This is a life altering time that we're in. Hmm. And maybe we need to allow it to be the reckoning that it is. Hmm. And um, years ago when I was going through a period of grief, um, a friend of mine who's a therapist said, there is nothing like grief that will make you feel out of control. Um, so to echo what Doyle just said and to normalize that for all of us. Um, and that's kind of a technique I think with dealing with anxiety is um, when you're caught up kind of in that almost like a tornado is what it feels like to me to try to cultivate this discipline of, of self-awareness presence in the moment to be like, this is normal to feel out of control because things are out of my control right now. Mm -hmm. There's no moral value to assign. I am not bad or good for feeling out of control. Mm -hmm. I just am. Mm -hmm. I'm just human in this. Um, and so to let that be what it is, um, we're grieving a lot of things now. And speaking of journaling, I think that might be something helpful um, for all of us is to write down like all the things that we have to grieve now, a child's graduation or prom, getting to see family members who live out of state, or perhaps those loved ones who live in assisted living centers that we can't visit, or perhaps if you're in that situation, the inability to see your loved ones. Um, or even smaller things, perhaps the way that you listen to a podcast or the radio on the way into work or school, and now you don't get that little moment of respite. Those are all things to grieve. They don't have to be the big things. They can be little things. Hmm. Um, and so on that note, Doyle, unless you have anything else, well, the only other thing I would say just, and I'll be brief, but you've heard me talk about Niebuhr's serenity prayer mm -hmm. and how the theologian Niebuhr wrote that at the time of Hitler. Yeah. To me, it can be a great opportunity for growth and serenity of mind, heart, and spirit when we can learn to surrender. Mm -hmm and accept yes i surrender is such a key word for me probably because i am terrible at it it's hard yeah, it is our our culture very much prizes um effort and agency and i do think those things are essential to every part of our lives but so is surrender and I would say surrender is more central to our life in Jesus than agency and activity is. Um, Not you know, our job. Will, thy will is what Jesus said. Yes. Our job is surrender and death. 
God's job is the growth and the resurrection. Amen. Um, amen. amen. <laughs> That's good. So, uh, That's good. You're getting to preaching, Amy. I am. <laughs> I love it. Um, so what we're going to do now to end our time together is um, just create this hopefully calming meditative space. Um, part of what I'm going to be doing is just inviting you um, to become aware of your physical body. Um, because as we said in the beginning, we are integrated whole beings. And sometimes we only focus on these ethereal, spiritual, intangible parts of who we are. But those things aren't separate from our physical bodies. Um, and so we're going to take a little bit of time to kind of check in with our bodies. And as I'm leading you through that, um, I'm also going to be talking um, through a devotional that relates to everything that we just talked about. Um, so for this time, I'm going to invite you, if you feel comfortable, to close your eyes. And just for a moment, um, kind of get in touch with how you are in whatever space you are right now. Maybe you're sitting at your desk in a chair. Maybe you're on your couch or sitting on your porch. Just wherever you are, take a big breath in and exhale. feels appropriate to you, just put your hand on your chest and inhale one more time and exhale. And just notice your body. You don't have to change anything. Just kind of check in, take account of your body, your muscles, if you feel any aches anywhere, just kind of note that. Um, notice if you're flexing somewhere in your body, <clears throat> maybe your toes. Sometimes I find myself um, flexing in my face, the space in between my eyebrows or even holding tension in my jaw. If I'm not talking, I'm clenching my teeth. So just take notice of any of that. I want to turn our attention <clears throat> to a very famous verse, which is Psalm 4610, Be still and know that I am God. I was thinking about this verse a couple weeks ago. And as I am wont to do, I decided I wanted to look up and see what the Hebrew is for those words that are so familiar to us in English. And the Hebrew for be still is Rafa. And when I looked at the list of possible definitions for this verb, I was surprised to find that so much of it had to do <clears throat> with our physical bodies. That really at its core, what that word means is slacken. Like when you finally kind of let your body go. Um, you're not holding yourself upright, either sitting or standing. You're just completely slack like in a deep state of sleep. And I thought about what is it that prevents us from doing that? What is that that prevents me from doing that? And one of the things is the environment that I'm in. You know, you can't just slacken anywhere. You can't do that, say, if you're riding on a bus, that might be dangerous. You have to be in the right space to allow that. You have to be in a safe space. So I invite you to think, 
What is this safe space that I need in my life? Where is God inviting me to that I can slacken, that I can be still? Because according to this verse, that's the first step in knowing God is slackening. It's releasing. It's sinking and letting go. Where is that place that I need to be? And then it's not a place you can access physically. If it's not a room in your house, maybe it's a memory. Maybe it's the one place where you got the best sleep in your life. Maybe it's a particular spot you went on vacation or a friend's house. But imagine that place and hold it in your heart and know that you can come back there. Maybe not in your body if it's not accessible to you, but at least in your mind. And that can be a place where you sit and you wait for God. Or maybe where you sit and have patience with that toddler of anxiety where you can invite, for me, her, to come sit, lay down with you. Say, I will listen to what you are trying to tell me. And then we're just going to relax in this moment. And we're going to know God. The other thing with that is it's hard to be in our bodies. It's hard to slacken when we know that grief is looming. But what if God is still going to be there in that grief? What if the voice of God is not the one scolding you, saying you shouldn't be upset about that stupid, insignificant thing that you're missing? What if that isn't God? What if the voice of God is saying, oh, sweetheart, I know, I'm so sorry. I'm sad you're missing that too. What if the voice of God validates you and says, I hear you, I hear your fear. I hear you and I'm not afraid. What if God is a big enough container for all your anxiety and all of your rage? Yes, rage. It's okay to be angry that things are going on the way they're going on. That's normal. What if God was bigger than all of that? Meaning you could release all of it into God's hands. And in the releasing, you could be, you could find that emptiness of, oh, now I can relax, I can slacken. The anger, the anxiety isn't tensing up my body anymore. I can release, let go, sink. Take one more deep breath in. Deep breath out. You can afford to be still because your assignment is to know God. If you want and it feels comfortable to you, you can let your eyes gently open. We are so glad that you joined us for this time. I hope that seeing our faces and hearing our voices has brought you a measure of peace. Um, that's how our humanity is designed, um, to see people that we love and cherish and have connection with and to feel just that flood of peace. I hope the tips that we've given you and shared with you are things that 
you will have a little bit of courage to try even if you feel silly. Don't worry, you're not being graded. Um, and I hope our time of just meditation, contemplation, helped you let go of achieving, let go of being able to logically explain everything and to experiment even if just for a little bit, that feeling of just being and slackening and letting go in your body. Doyle, do you have any closing words? Walk with grace and compassion. And we, we're praying for you and you are in our thoughts and prayers. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye guys. Take care.